Right, hello and welcome everyone to the first lecture in Automotive Engineering Fundamentals. Um, this lecture I'm going to talk about the course, a bit of introduction, talk about my expectations and the mark breakdown and a bit about the content, about why this course is in the Automotive um, Engineering option at the University of Windsor. And I'm also going to talk about a brief automotive engineering history from about the late 1800s, early 1900s up until present day. Now, before I talk about myself for the course or anything like that, I want to do a little activity here. Now, normally I would do this activity during lecture time, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, uh, we cannot meet in person. Uh, so I want to do a modified think-pair-share. So I want you to think about this title question, which is, why are you here? Why are you in this course? Why are you in the automotive option, I, at, particularly at the University of Windsor? I want you to think about this question for about two minutes on your own after this lecture, or you can pause the recording and do this now. Instead of pairing with someone, I'm going to set up a discussion board where everyone can put in, if they feel like sharing, they can put in their answers on this discussion board. And then there can come be somewhat of a discussion between the class on this particular subject. So what are some possible examples? Well, maybe you're interested in the topic, maybe it's just because you need it for the auto option, or maybe because you're not really sure why you're here. I would also really like to hear about what topics do you want discussed in this particular class? What are some of the things that you're interested in knowing about? Now, as I will discuss later, this is more of a introductory course um, and more of a surface level discussion about an entire range of important topics in automotive engineering. So nothing's gonna be covered um, in any amount of great depth. So as I said, I will post on Blackboard an announcement later as to how we can access this discussion board. Okay, so what a bit about the course about your teaching team. So I'm the instructor, Professor Nicholas Eves, or Nick Eves. I've been at the University of Windsor since July 2018, so as far as professor goes, I'm still fairly young. Um, here's my office. I haven't actually been in my office since about March or so. Um, also, if you call me, it's going to go to voicemail, and I actually dread going back to the office because I'm assuming I'll have tons of voicemails that I have to listen to. So the way you're going to be able to get into contact me predominantly is either during my office hours or email. Now, the thing about email is I get a lot of emails every day. I'm actually teaching three courses, plus I'm a capstone coordinator. So I'm going to have tons of emails this semester. In order to make sure I respond to your email and I don't lose it, always start your email with the subject line mech-3430. And it has to be exactly as it's written here, because I'm setting up email filters to automatically grab emails with this in the subject line so that it will go in a special folder that I will check on a nightly basis to make sure I'm responding to students. So please make sure you put this in your email, otherwise I'm gonna miss, potentially miss your email. Now my office hours, I say see the syllabus. Right now they are scheduled for Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. and they will be held in on Blackboard Virtual Collaborate, um, although this is subject to change by the start of the term. GAs at this time of the recording have not been determined. However, they will be in the syllabus posted on Blackboard as soon as uh, that I know that information. Uh, so a bit about myself, my interests in terms of research or teaching is in the thermal fluids area and my expertise is actually in combustion. Um, I spent a lot of time researching what's called soot, which is a a uh, really small nanoparticle that is mostly carbon that gets produced during combustion processes. Have you ever seen a diesel or an old school diesel engine put out a big black puff of smoke? Well, that smoke actually contains a bunch of really small carbon particles called soot. And so that's what my research interests are mostly in. Okay, so for again, before I get into the details of the course, well, what is the purpose of this course and how does it fit within the automotive option? Well, there's really two main goals of this particular course. The first one is to understand basic terminology and design options for the major components of a vehicle. So why do you need to know this? Well, when you start your career, once you graduate from fourth year and you're working for, say, potentially Ford, GM or Chrysler or maybe another automotive manufacturer, 
Well, you should be able to know what a piston is. You should know what a steering linkage is. You should know what a tie rod is. So it's to get an understanding of all the basic terminology of all the different components that you might end up designing as a mechanical engineer in the automotive sector. It's also to give you an understanding of the design options. So you can understand, okay, should or appreciate, should I be using a diesel engine or should I be using a gas engine? Should I be using a gasoline direct injection engine? Should I be using disc brakes or drum brakes? And understanding the design trade-offs for those options. Now, note nowhere I, did I say you will become an expert in how to design these components. This course is not going to make you an expert or capable of designing a suspension system. This course is solely to introduce the concepts and terminology and design options. There will be other specialized courses later that will focus more on individual component design. So suspension design, you'll take a course in dynamics, uh, probably taught by Dr. Miniker, who is an excellent professor in that area. Or you'll be taking internal combustion engines in fourth year, where you'll really learn about engine design in more detail. So again, very introductory course, understand the basic terminology, understand your design options from a pros and cons standpoint. But we're not going to go too much into the actual calculations and how shall I say design process. The other thing which this course focuses on is getting experience with a complex mechanical devices. Too many mechanical engineers go into industry without ever touching a wrench or a screwdriver or what have you and then are expected to design different components. When I was in high school I tore apart my first car to install an audio system and many a time I was very angry with the engineer who designed that car because it just didn't seem like it was a logical way to be able it was not designed in a logical way to be able to be serviced and why because they probably never actually used a wrench before or understood how difficult it was to work with their design. So the idea, part of the other part of this course is to get some experience with a complex mechanical device. You can actually appreciate the intricacies of trying to design something of that nature. Now, normally this would be done in the context of a hands-on lab. We would have groups of three to four students and you would tear down a basic um, internal combustion engine, a gasoline internal combustion engine, and then you would put it back together. Fortunately, because of COVID-19, that's not an option. So what we're going to do is instead we're going to have um, live streaming of some of the technicians and tearing down one particular engine and putting it back together. So it's not quite the same experience, but while they're tearing it down and putting it together, they're going to point out a lot of the um, intricacies in terms of designing the fit. So say, for example, making sure that the proper clearance between the piston and the cylinder walls and other aspects such as that. So we have to make a bit of a modification for COVID-19, but these are the two main things that we want students to get from this course. Now, there are a bunch of learning objectives listed in the course syllabus. I'm not going to go through them, but understand that these, all those course objectives all kind of relate back to these two big high level goals for these two courses or for, for this course. And I said, how does it fit in with the automotive option? Well, basically sets up all your specialized courses in four fear. I said internal combustion engine, um, looking at dynamics and other courses along in, in that nature. Okay, so now that we kind of know myself, we kind of know what the high level purpose of this course is, let's look at a bit more details. So what are the textbooks? Well, there's the main textbook, which I'm going to refer to and mostly going to teach from this textbook, is Vehicle Engine and Technology, second edition by Heisler. It's a very good book. Um, it covers all the basics of, of automotive engineering design. And it's a very, how I, the depth of which it goes through is very appropriate for this course. This textbook is not meant to make you an expert in any one subject, but it does give you, just like we said, in terms of the course objectives, a very good overview of all aspects of automotive engineering. There's also a book by Stone, which is complementary, Automotive Engineering Fundamentals. It's an alternative textbook. Um, some sections of, these, of the lectures will come from this textbook, but it's not required. 
in terms of getting maybe more in terms of the latest in terms of what's going on in terms of automotive engineering the SEA technical paper series is a very good resource now these are scholarly research articles that are published very much so with an automotive engineering uh, focus so a lot of these studies won't be what I would call fundamental research so they're not like myself where we're trying to figure out how the mole how molecules cluster together to form a nano soot particle. These papers are more focused at industry and looking at research in terms of, you know, how do we, here was a method to reduce the emissions from this particular internal combustion engine. So there are, the research published in these journals are much more practical and relevant to the practicing automotive engi engineer. So I really, um, I really cannot recommend these papers enough. And also these will be used for your special topics project, or you'll need to use these papers for your special topics project, which I'll discuss a bit later um, in this lecture as well. Okay, so let's talk about the course evaluation. So there are four things that I'm going to evaluate, or at least four, um, how shall I say, um, different areas that I'm going to be evaluating. So there's a special topic project that's going to be worth 10% of your mark. Uh, there will be instructions posted on Blackboard with regards to this project. But the idea is, is that, that students will form teams of about four to five students, uh, no more than five, and only less than four if there is not sufficient students. Um, and the idea will be this team will become mini experts in a topic of their choice. Now the topics must be approved by me. And this team will make a presentation on this topic to the class. So the main point of this project is actually to enrich the learning experience, not only for your classmates, but also for myself. Maybe you will find, um, you know, I'm not an expert in all areas of automotive engineering, but maybe you'll find some um, interesting research on the latest topic in this domain. And it might also teach me something as well. And that would be kind of the goal of this particular project. Uh, now, where are you going to find information for, for these topics or resources? It's going to be those SCE technical papers. Um, I'm going to ask every member in a given team on a given topic to review one article. So if there's a team of five, the team will review five articles and then make a presentation based on the findings of those five articles. So that's the 10% special topics project. There's another 20% for labs and assignments, and within that, 15% of the mark approximately is going to be towards the, or 10% sorry, is going to be towards the engine teardown lab. So while you're watching these live stream, uh, the end live stream engine teardown lab, the technicians, myself or the GAs are going to discuss different aspects of the design of this internal combustion engine. Where you're going to have more or less a report with fairly pointed questions that you have to answer. And the only way you're going to get these answers if you're paying attention to these live streams. The answers won't be available readily anywhere else. Um, they may be available in the manual for, for the engine, um, but they might not. So this is going to require more or less just paying attention during those live streams and absorbing and making notes on the data. Uh, there's also going to be assignments related to design of a simple gear train or a small a gear train for a very small um, RC sized vehicle. Um, that's going to be within this 20% as well. And then there's a midterm and a final exam. Midterm were 30%, final exam were 40. Now I've kind of talked about my expectations for the special topics project. For the engine lab report, I've also discuss that as well, the expectations that you'll be paying attention to the live streams. Gear train design lab report. So for this, you'll be asked to design a gear train for a very small scale RC car, and you'll be given some design specifications. Now, what I want to see in this design is since we won't have the opportunity to actually build these vehicles in the lab this year, you have to be able to show with calculations that this gear train will actually meet the design specifications. It doesn't have to be a very long report, but I do want to see 
actual calculation engineering and not based on, well, we think this will work. You have to back it up with actual calculations. And we'll talk about designing a gear train and basic calculations you, you can use to design for different specifications. In the past, the midterm and finals in this course have been heavily based on memorization, uh, particularly the midterm, um, but also the final as well. They've been based on memorizing the terminology and the basic design options um, for the components that we're going to look at in this course. Now, if that doesn't really work given our situation with COVID-19, um, remote proctoring has many, many issues, and I don't want uh, to bring those into this course. So the, my expectations for the midterm and final are going to be different. If you do have copies of previous midterms and finals, the last time I taught this course, or other instructors have taught this course, they aren't going to be very relevant to this offering. Um, in this offering, I'm going to make the midterms and final exam is more of a discussion about designing and making design choices and how you justify your design choices. So there will be a bit of um, des describing and memorization as well, but that's not no longer going to be the focus because of our current climate with COVID-19. Uh, so just be aware, the midterm and final, they're going to be different formats than what you've seen maybe in previous years you know, if you've had access to previous year exams. So that's very important. So any questions you have about the course evaluation, my expectations, now is the time to ask. You don't want to be asking and realizing right before it was for the midterm, oh, I don't really know, or before the lab. Think about what I just said now and send me an email. Come see me during my office hours to discuss my expectations and also the course evaluation breakdown. Okay, so that's all I want to do to discuss in terms of the course introduction. As I said, there is a syllabus that is going to be posted and updated at least during the first week of the course. Um, all important announcements in terms of timing of different labs, um, in terms of where you should be at, in terms of watching the lectures, that'll all be done through Blackboard announcements. Um, all the lectures in this course are going to be a, asynchronous in nature, i.e. you'll be expected to watch them on your own time. I won't be presenting any lectures live. Um, and my, your interaction with myself will predominantly be during office hours. If there's any questions about the material that I presented, anything that needs clarification, that's how you will in, in interact with me. Okay, so let's get on to the actual um, informational part, I guess you could say, of, of this lecture. I'm going to do go through a brief history of automotive engineering. So when the idea of a vehicle or car was kind of first invented, uh, there was actually very strong opposition to the automobile. Um, before this, we had our horse and buggy, and there was actually very strong, um, not only from, say, politicians, but also um, the average citizen towards automobiles. So what are some of these crazy regulations that I'm referring to? Well, in the UK, there is a regulation that you could not go over four miles per hour in your car, four miles per hour, if you convert that to metric, that's something around seven kilometers an hour or so, which is very slow. Um, and there's also a need for a person with a red flag to run in front of the car to alert others that a car was coming. So if you've ever seen um, Austin Powers, when you have, there was a scene, um, this is kind of dating me, but there's a scene in this movie where Austin Powers is screaming as the villain is coming towards him with a very, very slow moving um, vehicle or roller machine to run him over. Now it's going so slow he could have easily jumped out of the way. And this is kind of exactly what um, was meant by crazy regulations. At seven kilometers an hour, four miles per hour, there's no reason the average person couldn't get out of the way. But no, they felt the need to have someone with a red flag running in front of the car to alert others were coming. Now in the US, uh, in the automobile, um, if there was a horse, so a horse-drawn carriage coming, the automobile was the one that had to pull off the road and hide in the forest slash woods because they were afraid that the vehicle would scare the horses. 
So in the very beginning, even though it's very clear by today's standards how important the autom or automobile is, initially it was held with a lot of a lot of resistance. Now the thing that kind of started making this go away was there's the introduction of the Auto Car Magazine and the British Auto Show. Now this is 1985, it was actually introduced in 1885, uh, but the introduction of this magazine and this auto show really started to get the general citizen or general population, also politicians, interested and realizing, wait a minute, this new invention of the auto was actually pretty good. Um, and in Europe, really, they had the first success with internal combustion engines around the 1880s, and France actually led uh, vehicle manufacturing around the world in the 1890s. And it really wasn't until the 1900s that the US actually kind of caught up to Europe and particularly to France in terms of vehicle uh, manufacturing. Um, and so the first drive in the US was actually by the Dure brothers in a vehicle with a single cylinder engine. So you can imagine now most vehicles have at least four cylinders. So this was a single cylinder engine and happened in Springfield in, in the US. So in the beginning, things were, um, it wasn't adopted very readily and it actually took a while for the automobile to gain some traction, no pun intended. Okay, so who was the actual first US manufacturer? Now, I should mention that this lecture is heavily um, biased towards talking about what was happening in the US in terms of automotive engineering. Uh, the simple reason for that is that there are, um, in terms of automotive engineering opportunities available in the Windsor region, uh, U.S. companies, GM, Chrysler, Ford, they're by far the biggest hire of our graduates. So this whole lecture kind of has a bit of a U.S. tilt um, in terms of the history of automotive engineering. Um, so as I said, the first U.S. manufacturer of automobiles, it really is kind of debated who was first. Um, there, there isn't very clear um, who was actually first, but by all we know is by 1897, there were kind of four different manufacturers. Uh, there was Pope Electrics, there was Dure, there was Stanley Steamers, and then there was Winton. Now what's interesting, you can tell by some of these names that the first automobiles actually weren't all powered by internal combustion engines. Pope Electrics, they actually had an electric motor. So the whole concept of electric vehicle is actually over a century old. It's not something new. Um, the whole reason why the electric vehicle didn't take off in the 1900s is because energy density. It was simply impossible to store enough energy in the batteries from 100 years ago to actually propel a vehicle for anything more than a kilometer. So the reason electric vehicles were somewhat shoved to the side for almost a century is simply because we didn't have the energy storage. You can store a lot more energy in hydrocarbons, even today, than you can in, a, in terms of weight and density or volume than you can in an electric battery. Uh, then there was Stanley Steamers, and they actually had vehicles that were run on steam engines. Now, that died fairly quickly. It was quite impractical. Um, but there were early companies that were actually trying to power vehicles with steam engines. Um, so there was other options in terms of how the vehicle could be propelled. So if you did choose an internal combustion engine or gasoline, the engine could be either air or water cooled. You could have a four or two stroke. And for the transmission, you could have an electric friction or chain transmission. Now we're gonna talk about what air or water cooled, what four or two stroke means later in this course. Um, we're not gonna to talk too much about the electric friction or chain transmission as those aren't really relevant to modern automotive engineering, but just know that you know there was very, um, overall there was very limited options when you were designing a vehicle uh, in terms of what you could do in terms of your propulsion device and in terms of your transmission. Things are pretty basic. So we had the introduction of the internal combustion engine and that seemed to be the propulsion device of choice or that seemed to make the most sense from a practical standpoint. But up until this point um, in the early 1800s, 
they were all mechanical. There was no electronics on the vehicle or even in the internal combustion engine in any way. Now, from about 1900 to World War I, there was rapid change in automotive design and manufacturing. And this was actually mostly led by this engineer named Charles Kettering. Now, he was an engineer for Cadillac. Um, this is back when Cadillac was actually known for being, you know, the top luxury vehicle as opposed to now as being second rate to BMW and Mercedes-Benz and all the European models. But this Charles Kettering, he actually designed the breaker point ignition. So igniting based on um, this concept or igniting the fuel in the engine based on this concept. And he actually developed the electric starter. Um, so before this, if you wanted to start your engine, you had to, for your vehicle, you had to get out and actually manually turn a crank to actually start up the engine. And so this little sketch down here, this is a little sketch of a breaker point ignition system. And this is another sketch of it beside it. And then at the top of this, this is an electric starter on the top right. This is an image of an electric starter. So basically before the 1900s, there was almost no electronics on in the vehicle or in the internal combustion engine. Now after 1900, getting to, close to World War I, um, there was also rapid improvements in manufacturing of vehicles. And there was what was called mass production. Now, a lot of people think Henry Ford um, invented the idea of the, sem the assembly line, but actually Henry Ford was the one who brought the assembly line to automotive manufacturing. So he borrowed it from other industries and said, hey, we should apply this to automotive manufacturing. And what this actually started was it in, resulted in a massive reduction in the amount of time it took to build individual components. So Henry Ford started this idea of assembly line mass production with magnetos. And it actually took the build time from 20 minutes, so having one person build an entire magneto took 20 minutes of time, versus he could pump out a magneto every five minutes if he had different stations working on different components. So that the assembly line really reduced the total manufacturing time. The Model T, which was the first vehicle or one of the first vehicles that Ford produced, the total production time went from three hours to 93 minutes. So that is almost a factor of a factor of two in terms of the manufacturing time because of this assembly line. Now modern, or should I say not modern, but vehicles of the time around 1900s, World War I, they were built for very rough terrain. So they weren't built necessarily for comfort and they had to be very uh, how shall we say robust and that was one of the main considerations was that they could withstand rough terrain so they weren't exactly um, how shall we say um, fairly nice riding they were actually just built to withstand this rough terrain so they wouldn't be they wouldn't fall apart and they'd be able to withstand it now at this time really only the rich could afford cars or, or, or automobiles. So this is still going up towards World War One, a bit past that. Um, but then Ford, Henry Ford kind of thought, well, this isn't really um, sustainable long term. If I'm only selling to rich people, well, once rich people all own vehicles, I won't have anyone else to sell to. So Ford actually did something very um, novel at the time was Ford said, I'm going to increase the wages of my workers. So Ford said, you know, I'm going to pay my workers more than what I have in. Well, this actually created the middle class. The middle class was born out of starting to pay factory workers a more decent wage. And by doing this, Ford created a larger market for his cars. Basically, his own workers would then go out and pay and buy Ford vehicles. So it was kind of a circular loop. Yes, he was paying his workers more, but the money was coming right back to the company anyways. So it became this kind of circular uh, loop and he basically created the middle class. He also reduced shift times. Um, instead of having 12 or 14 hour shifts and only one shift a day, he said, I'm going to do three eight hour shifts 
So in other words, he could manufacture 24 hours a day so he could produce a lot more vehicles. Before, workers would work 12 to 14 hour shifts um, in somewhat brutal conditions, and they wouldn't have any opportunity to go out or enjoy life, essentially. Uh, but by doing this, creating these three eight hour shifts, Ford created more of a standard of how you could have somewhat resembling a work-life balance. And so in other words, there was a need for a car to, you could actually use it to go out um, and go places. Now, with while Ford was doing all this, um, there was also another individual called William Durant, and he formed General Motors by combining Buick Motor Company, Olds or Oldsmobile. Now, if you're old like me, you might actually know or have driven in an Oldsmobile before. This brand doesn't really exist. And Cadillac. Now, again, this was when Cadillac was actually known for precision manufacturing and being top quality. Um, so then this William Durant, as General Motors CEO, he tried to also acquire Ford into the General Motors um, envelope. Well, he failed, and then the sh board of General Motors fired him. So then Durant said, okay, well, I'm going to team up with this person named Louis, Louis Chevrolet, and we're going to form Chevrolet Motors. Eventually, Chevrolet Motors started becoming a force to be reckoned with and was actually overshadowing General Motors. And so then finally they moved, merged back with GM, and Durant was once again the CEO or leader of GM. So in this time, we were starting to see more increase in the middle class, but also more competitors in the automotive industry. It was no longer just Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company producing automobiles. Then came the 1920s. So now we're past the World War I stage. Peep the general citizen can now start to afford a vehicle. Um, it's not just the rich anymore. And so in 1920s, people started looking at performance. So instead of a single cylinder engine, like there was in that way back when for that, in the early late 1800s for the first drive in Springfield, they now looked at V8s or engines with eight cylinders. So much larger engines, much more powerful. And in terms of v, not only V8s, but also what was called a straight eight. Now we'll look at what those mean in terms of engine configurations in this course as well. There was also an invention by Harry Ricardo, which is the turbulent combustion chamber. Um, and what this really allowed you to do was to get more compression, which we'll learn is very important for engine efficiency with what is considered poor quality fuels. So this was a huge revolution that you, we could use poor quality fuels while still getting um, the power we needed to propel our vehicles and get more performance. Um, all vehicle systems really benefited from R&D at this point. It wasn't just the internal combustion engine. There was R&D in terms of suspension, brakes, everything was really being driven by intense research and development. And there was also a shift towards closed-topped vehicles. Um, manufacturers realized that a closed top is way more practical in terms of driving your vehicle in poor weather. Uh, before this time, people would only really drive their vehicle or be outside in good weather. Um, particularly, this was more important in the northern U.S. and also Canada, uh, given we have this wonderful season called winter. And this resulted in much more sales. It was just more practical, more useful. Um, in the beginning, all the frames were actually wooden frames. So I don't think if anyone could imagine nowadays driving a vehicle with a wooden frame at the speeds that we currently drive vehicles. Um, but eventually they transferred over from this wooden frame over to steel. And what did the steel frame allow for? Well, more safety. Um, it wasn't as easy to break. Um, and also it was more comfortable. Um, it was, you could design it um, it was more predictable in terms of how rigid it was going to be, and you could design suspensions to complement the steel frame much more easily than you could for a wooden frame. And so along this idea of using more steel, um, they actually moved towards using steel roofs as opposed to just fabric roofs. And this really 
improve the structural design, the structural rigidity of, of the vehicle. And this in turn improved the safety. And so GM was actually the first company that said, we should start marketing our vehicles not only in terms of performance, but in terms of how safe they are. So GM was the first automotive company that actually said, well, we should also look at our products in terms of safety and market how our, how our vehicles are more safe or safer than other competitors. Uh, GM also started the first um, crash test or doing crash testing. Um, now in the 1930s though, when they started it, they would just observe. They would take a vehicle, roll it over, run it into a cement barrier and say, oh, okay, that looks like it would be really bad if you're in that vehicle. But they didn't necessarily know how to collect the data from those crashes to make better design choices. They simply said, yep, rolling over your vehicle, not a good idea. But they didn't really have the measurements or tools to act upon that data. Um, and around all this time, we then had the 1930s, which was the Great Depression. Um, very low auto sales, many people struggling to have enough money to survive. So automotive sales fell dramatically and many automotive companies went bankrupt around this time. Only the major big ones such as GM and Ford were really able to survive. But there were many small companies that I haven't mentioned uh, that ended up going bankrupt. So now we're in post-World War II. So this is in, you know, past the 1940s into the 1950s. Um, and during World War II, actually a lot of auto companies moved to war manufacturing. So in other words, instead of manufacturing automobiles, they were now manufacturing ammunition or other wartime supplies. And now after World War II, Europe was fairly destroyed. A lot of the major cities, a lot of the major infrastructure in Europe was destroyed. So in other words, there wasn't the capacity to manufacture automobiles as much. And thus the US auto industry really boomed. Um, you, for the most part, North America and the US wasn't really directly affected by the war in terms of the cities or the infrastructure. Um, so they were after World War II, the U.S. auto market was, or industry was able to pick up right where it left off, and it really became the dominant manufacturer in the world in terms of U.S. Um, during this time, the post-World War II era, there was lots of chrome and very large tail fins. So we look at this image of a 62 sedan. We see lots of chrome on the bumper, both front and rear, and these very large tail fins on the trunk area. Now, back then in this area, the engineers didn't have a concept of aerodynamics, period. Um, they didn't really understand how that making a big, bulky, square looking vehicle was very bad in terms of um, aerodynamic efficiency and drag on the vehicle. Also at this time, fuel was very cheap. Um, you know, some fuel economy figures for vehicles of this age would have been around 10 miles per gallon. Now, by today's standards, that is absolutely atrocious fuel economy. But in this time frame, petrol or gasoline or diesel wasn't really used in consumer vehicles at this time. It was very cheap, so poor fuel economy didn't really matter. It wasn't a purchasing decision. You didn't buy a vehicle based on that it had good fuel economy. You bought it based on how much chrome, how bulky, how big, and how big the tail fin was. Also, you purchased a vehicle based on how big the engine was. Um, so performance was really proportional to price. So what people paid premiums for weren't for comforts. So nowadays, when you buy a luxury vehicle, you're paying because it might have heated seats. It might have leather. Um, it might even have um, a really smart cruise control where it can adjust the distance between the car in front of you. Well, that wasn't what people paid for back then. They paid for performance. If you had a bigger engine, that directly proportional to the price of the vehicle. In other words, the vehicle was the engine. The rest of it was just a frame. Um, and there wasn't really much attention put into any of the other comfort features in the vehicle. So on this image down here, this is a 1955 Chevrolet at a drag strip. Now, what is a drag strip? 
A drag strip is basically a quarter mile or 400 meter long race track. And this became very popular around this 1950s, 1960s, where engines kept getting bigger, performance kept getting more important, and it was actually more of a social type of status, having a vehicle with a big engine and being able to run a fast quarter mile. So that also brings me to the 1960s, which is the muscle car era. Um, so in the 1960s, as I said, everyone was really racing. All manufacturers in the U.S. were racing towards higher horsepower vehicles. Um, it's kind of what is happening with today. If you look at trends from about 1995 onwards or even 1990, vehicles have increasingly have higher and higher and higher power. Um, regardless of whether it's actually needed in day-to-day -day life, if you look at what was considered a performance vehicle in 1990, might have been 300 horsepower. Now in 2020, a performance vehicle is something five to 600 horsepower. So much like today, but in a much, how shall I say, shorter time frame, the time frame of only five, seven years, horsepower went from 200 to 400. So in a very small amount of time, vehicles, there was a big push to produce vehicles of higher and higher power. Uh, also in this 1960 era, the Society of American Engineers, or SAE, uh, started developing testing standards. So GM was doing crash testing in 1930s, um, but nobody outside of the individual manufacturers really developed any standards or regulations to make sure vehicles were safe. Well, in the 1960s, this changed with, there was not only this SAE developing testing standards, but there was also uh, national laws put into place. Now, these are laws from American law, but generally whatever was introduced in America, Canada more or less followed suit. Um, so there's the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 1967 that dictated testing methods and minimum levels of safety. Um, this is also around the time that GM developed the high speed impact sled and head injury criteria. So not only were they observing crash tests at this point, but they were actually tying um, the data they were getting from the crash test to the probability of a head injury occurring. And they were trying to design to reduce this probability. So they were actually collecting data and using it and feeding it back into their design process. If we see this graph here, if we see around 1947, this is the highway deaths per million vehicle miles. So in other words, how many deaths per million miles of a vehicle being driven? Um, and we can see there has been a steady decline with a particularly sharp drop around the 1960s and then followed by more steady declines. So up until this point, people did not really care about fuel economy when you're purchasing a vehicle. Well, this changed in the 1970s. 1970s was the energy crisis. Um, oil supply became very short. There was not enough oil to meet the demand. And this was a very big problem for US manufacturing of vehicles because they were focused on luxury, big and powerful, i.e. vehicles that were not very fuel economy or did not have very good fuel economy. So what happened in the 1970s was from an American standpoint, uh, take an example, a muscle car, a muscle car that was built in 1969 probably had 400 horsepower. Trying to reduce the amount of fuel it was consuming and improve fuel economy, by 1971, that same vehicle only had 200 horsepower. So US manufacturers were struggling with how do we improve the fuel economy of our vehicles. And what happened as a, as a result was power levels dropped dramatically. And as I said, power levels really continued to drop until the 1980s and didn't really start to recover until about 1990. And during all this time in America, there was a very strong surge in import sales um, because a lot of importer vehicles developed in say Japan or Europe were generally smaller and more fuel efficient. And now why is this the case? Well, it really comes around to differences to how the infrastructure was developed and when vehicles arrived. So in Europe, the roads were windy and narrow because they were being used for horse and buggy for hundreds and hundreds of years. Europe is much more, um, developed Europe is much older than North America. 
So in other words, in Europe, you needed a small agile car to be able to handle these small winding narrow roads. Well, in North America, the roads actually were developed alongside the automobile. So when they developed roads in North America, they made them bigger because they wanted to be able to have their big, luxury, powerful cars. So in other words, there's more straight lines. So while Europeans were trying to develop cars to handle their winding narrow roads, we were developing vehicles in North America um, to, and were taking advantage of the fact that we had more control over the infrastructure and how it related to the automobile. Now, of course, as we just said, in 1970s, this kind of changed, and all of a sudden, there's a lot more Japanese, uh, European vehicles that were smaller and more fuel in nature being sold in North America. Now, around the 1970s and well, there's also what's called the rise of lean manufacturing. Now, this is kind of, lean manufacturing is kind of a counter to mass production. So the 1970s, with being more fuel efficient, also more cost effective was a very important issue. So mass production became kind of a problem in and of, of itself. Even though mass production really um, kick-started the whole automotive manufacturing um, industry, it started became becoming a problem. And the idea was, okay, if you have mass production, the, the line is constantly moving. Well, if the line's constantly moving, what happens if you have a defective part? Well, the idea back then was if you have a defective part, you just install it as it is, move on, and then have a rework team to fix it later. Now, you can imagine if you messed up a part at the very beginning of the assembly of the vehicle, and then you had to fix it later, well, that was a huge time investment. You basically have to tear apart the entire vehicle again to get down to that one part that you had to change. Mass production also required large stockpiles of parts and inventory. You had to be able to stock all these parts so that you could always have them on hand. Um, this cost money in terms of overhead and also just in terms of acquiring this inventory. Now, Japanese manufacturer thought this was very wasteful. And this actually led to the idea of lean manufacturing or just-in-time manufacturing. In other words, you wouldn't have huge stockpiles of inventory, but you would actually have vendors or other um, sub-manufacturers supply inventory just as you needed it. So you wouldn't have to have a huge warehouse, you'd only have a small stockpile. Now I actually worked at the, the Toyota manufacturing plant in Cambridge, at, uh, Cambridge, Ontario, and this Toyota being a Japanese company was very big on lean manufacturing or just-in-time manufacturing. And it was quite amazing to see the fork trucks zip, it was always zipping around the uh, production plant because there was always parts being moved continuously because there was continuously new stock being brought into the plant. There wasn't these huge stores or of inventory. Also what they did was if there was a problem the workers could stop the line and fix the part right there. Now even though this might have shut down the entire line overall it still saved time not having to reassemble and remove parts that have been put on a vehicle just to get to the broken part. There's also a lot more focus on problem solving at the source, um, five whys, which I'll go through an example below, and having a team develop solution that worked for all. Now, this is also pioneered very much by the Japanese automotive manufacturing, is instead of an engineer who had never seen, potentially never actually worked on the production life, production line in their life, instead of them saying, well, I think this is the best way to solve it, they would actually involve the operator. They would involve the line manager in the decision or developing or in the process of developing a solution. As an engineer, there's no point developing a solution if you're not involving the stakeholders from the first step. And working at Toyota Motor Manufacturing Cambridge, they were very good at doing this, very good at involving the operators in the designs or in the solutions from step one. And normally, you always came up with a better solution. Why not talk to the people that are working with it day to day? So I said I'll go through an example of the five whys. Now this is about why a vehicle won't start, but it's kind of the idea. So a vehicle won't start is the problem. Okay, well we want to find the root cause so we can make sure subsequent vehicles will actually start or this problem doesn't happen again. First why, okay, the battery's dead. Okay, the alternator isn't functioning. Well, the alternator belt was broken. The alternator belt was well beyond its useful service life. 
the vehicle was not maintained according to the recommended service schedule. So this is the root cause, was basically the person owning the vehicle was not um, doing the proper maintenance. Now, in a manufacturing standpoint, it might be that the alternator was installed incorrectly. And then you would ask five whys until you figure out why that alternator was not installed correctly. What part of the pr process, whether it be a component, a person, or a procedure, was causing this to occur? A lot of the times previous to this, you would have an alternator not working, um, and basically the solution would be, okay, well, let's put a new one on, as opposed to preventing the problem from happening in the first place. In other words, there's a lot of Band-Aid type of solutions in automotive engineering uh, prior to this. So as a last slide, I want to talk about more modern. By modern, I mean in the last 30 to 40 years. So um, even that doesn't really encompass a lot of what you would call really modern, i.e. the 2000s. But I'm going to talk a bit about that at the very bottom of this slide. So around the 1970s, along with the energy crisis, emissions started to be an issue. People started to realize that when you burn hydrocarbons, the resultant products coming out the tailpipe are not good for human health and they're not good for the environment. So governments started putting regulations on the emissions of unburned hydrocarbons, UHC, nitrous oxide, a very powerful greenhouse gas that actually causes, causes acid rain, and carbon monoxide. So there are now emission limits on unburned hydrocarbons, NOx, and CO. What you notice though is there's no emission limits on CO2, which is the main greenhouse gas that everyone is concerned about now. So even though there was emission limits on these three categories, at this point there still weren't limits on CO2, in other words, fuel economy, and there is no limits on soot particles, which is, was again my research area. So this resulted in much reduction in compression ratio and other factors, which gave you less performance. This is why after 1970, power dropped off dramatically and it didn't really start to recover until 1990. There's also a need for catalytic converters, exhaust gas recirculation, and unleaded fuel to reduce these emissions. So once you got to the 1980s, once you kind of got the emissions somewhat under control, uh, the main efforts are really in safety, fuel efficiency, and emission reduction. This really hasn't changed. The, the, the main efforts or the main concerns of most automotive manufacturers are still safety, fuel efficiency, and emission reduction. And if anything, the fuel efficiency and emission reduction keep becoming more and more important. Same with safety. Um, we ended up replacing carburetors. That was a method of mixing fuel and air before it goes into the engine. We'll talk about that in this course. With electronic fuel injectors, there's even more and more digital control, again, similar to today. There was a lot more use of computer-aided design, finite element method, computational fluid dynamics, and they all play, started to play a very large role in the design process. And even more recently in the last 20 years, even the last five years, there's been a, and even the last year when you look at it, there's been a very strong push towards zero emission, so electric, fuel cell, ultra clean combustion, and driver assistance features, even pure autonomous vehicles. Now, in terms of the driver assistance features or pure autonomous or even electric, these are areas that are not classically considered underneath mechanical engineering, but it's becoming even more and more increasingly important that for Automotive engineering is no longer the complete domain, shall you say, of mechanical engineers. It was that way up until about the 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s. It was The vehicle was still very much predominantly designed by mechanical engineers. As there are more and more electronics, more and more smart driver assistance features, more and more it's becoming the domain of electrical engineers, electric motors, and also software engineers are also another big component. Um, in the automotive design in the industry. So just keep that in mind as you're right now a mechanical engineer at the University of Windsor is that there is increasingly a larger um, array of skills that, that you need in order to be a well-rounded overall um, automotive engineer. Okay, so that's the lecture that I had for today. Um, in our next lecture, we're going to start discussing the internal combustion engine. Uh, we're also going to discuss, well, why, you know, I just talked about how electric vehicles are becoming more and more important. Well, why are we still learning about internal combustion engines? So I'm going to talk about that as well.
and we're going to go forward with that for about the next two to three lectures before we move on to other components um, in the vehicle. Right, as I said, if you have any questions or concerns of what I said in terms of my expectations or anything to do with this history lesson, please feel free to send me an email or come see me during office hours. See you next lecture.